Hello everybody and welcome to this latest video on Tsarist and Communist Russia. Today that we're going to look at autocracy in reaction under Alexander II. And this is really interesting because Alexander II seems to shift dramatically from this great reforming Tsar that we've seen in some earlier videos, for example, with the emancipation of the serfs in 1861 and then further reforms with local government and uh, the law and the military, to reverting back to kind of Tsarist type and being reactionary and opposing all developments and change. And that sometimes there are some really quite serious reasons behind this, such as people trying to kill him. Um, so he's a really interesting character, Alexander II. He, he is difficult to absolutely pin down and go, right, is this a reforming czar? Is he half-hearted about reform? Does he only do it when he's forced into it? Or is he genuinely reforming, but he keeps on being pulled back by reactionary groups within his um, circle? So this part of the... Um, the this part of the course kind of reflects a variety of key questions. So the main one we're, we're focusing on is, is how Russia was governed and how did political authority change and develop. And we're seeing a lot of that change with the move from reform to reaction to back to reform again. Uh, we're going to touch on some stuff on, on how op opposition developed and how effective it was, because we can see some really negative impacts of, of, of opposition in this in terms of it, it has the what you would expect to be the reverse effect, but not necessarily. And we'll look at opposition in more detail in future videos. Now, another one of the key questions about the important role of individuals and groups and how these affected developments. Obviously, Alexander II is in himself a key individual, and then we're going to meet um, some other key individuals in this video as well. So first of all, I want to have a, a bit of a look at Alexander II, the man, and he, he's, uh, well, he, he's as controversial in his private life as he is in terms of a historical figure and, and reform and reaction. Um, so his uh, the first marriage is to um, Maria, who, who was originally uh, Marie of Hesse, who met Alexander when he was on tour of Western Europe looking for a bride, and she was just 14. Uh, she moved to Russia in 1840, uh, converted to the Russian Orthodox Church, and married Alexander II in 1841. Um, <clears throat> they were married until her death in 1880, and she gave birth to eight children for him, six sons and two daughters. Uh, she suffered a lot in her later half of her life with uh, TB. Um, she was really devastated when their eldest son, um, uh, Nicholas, died in 1865. He was just 21 at the time. Um, we're kind of slightly limited on knowing exactly what it was he died of, but we think it's some kind of um, meningitis type illness linked possibly to a, a wrestling injury. Uh, this really did have a de devastating impact on his m and his mother. And his father, Alexander II, um, took comfort in taking a mistress. And this was a mistress which he took a bit more seriously than the other mistresses that he had. Um, Catherine, his, his mistress, were, was 19 when they got together. He was 48. Um, she was the daughter of a nobleman who had died. Uh, she was being educated at this special uh, institute for noble maidens. Um, and where he, he she caught Alexander II's eye. Um, she had four children by the Tsar. Uh, they did eventually marry um, 40 days after the death of his first wife. She already had multiple children by him by then. Uh, and she, she was um, given uh, the title of princess following that. Uh, her children were, were not not part of the succession plan. They were kind of prevented from, from that. The whole relationship was enormously controversial, caused great scandal at court, um, caused, great, caused great scandal um, with uh, the Tsar's own children, particularly uh, because Catherine was living in the Winter Palace uh, whilst uh, Alexander II's uh, first wife was still alive. So... <laughs> He is quite a colourful uh, character in terms of his private life, definitely highly controversial. Um, his uh, relationship uh, with Catherine had an enormously kind of scandalous effect, not only within Russia, but within the other courts around Europe. Right. <laughs> Alexander II was not popular with everybody. Um, and we will look at more at opposition in future videos, but there were a number of significant attempts on his life. In 1866, a, a former 
a student shoots at him uh, and misses. Alexander assumed that whoever was trying to kill him must be uh, Polish because of the recent Polish uprising uh, and, and must be a, uh, a peasant and was quite shocked to find out that the guy trying to shoot him was neither. Um, there was an attempt by a Polish immigrant to um, to shoot him in 1867, um, but the bullets hit a, a horse and a cavalryman instead. In um, 1879, there's again there's another former student, and we'll see why we get reaction on education because of this, who, who tries um, to shoot him, fires at him five times, but um, fails to hit him. Uh, in in 1879, later in that year, in December, there's an attempt to blow him up. There's a a bomb planted under a train, but they plant it under the wrong train, uh, and it, so therefore it doesn't do them any harm. Uh, in February 1880, there was a bomb actually put in by a carpenter in the Winter Palace in the dining room. Uh, the bomb went off, it killed 12 people, it injured 50, but fortunately for Alexander II, he was late um, to dinner that day and so survived. So when we look at the reactionary elements under uh, Alexander II, then we, we see particularly a movement in 1866 when it becomes more reactionary. And maybe this is some of the context to what we've seen in these last two um, parts of the video. One is there is people trying to kill him in 1866 and 1867. In 1865, his eldest son has died at the young age of 21. So there is a lot going on for Alexander II at that point in time. So there is growing opposition, and we see this with groups being formed like Young Russia in 1862 that opposed the Tsar and the Russian Orthodox Church, and also a brilliantly named uh, opposition group, The Organization, set up in 1863 by some Moscow students. So again, we see this link between universities and opposition. Alexander II then started to pull back from his reforming instincts, started to listen to the reactionaries. Now, the reaction is, re, reaction is kind of the opposite of reform. These are people who don't want things to change. And they dislike the free press. They dislike what they, they saw as Western ideas. And they also disliked anybody who essentially who wasn't Russian. They disliked the, the minority groups. They disliked the religions that weren't Russian Orthodox Christianity. And listening to these voices, the, the Tsar moves in 1866 and appoints a set of new people and puts them in charge of different ministries. So uh, Dmitry Tolstoy is re replaces uh, Golovin uh, as Minister of Education. Uh, Timoshev um, replaces uh, Valuev as Minister of Internal Affairs. Um, Shevelov becomes um, head of the third section, which is the secret police. Uh, and Palin becomes Minister for Justice. And that, these guys are going to be really significant in terms of peeling back reform and trying to get hold of that uh, kind of iron grip of autocracy in Russia again. So in terms of education, uh, Tolstoy sets out to get rid of all the Western ideas and that was spreading through and, and remove all this kind of opposition and uh, criticism of the Tsar. So he gave the church control of the rural schools again, at uh, primary level, at secondary level, at the gymnasium, schools could not teach natural sciences. Um, from 1871, only students from the gymnasium could go to university. Um, students at modern technical schools uh, could only go on to the higher technical institutions. So they're limiting the number of people going to the universities to start off with. And then we get what happens at the university. And this is the bit that's going to make you all sad in terms of some of the, particularly one of the, his, the subjects which is banned at this point. So uh, university, uh, literature, the study of literature was banned. The study of science was banned. The study of modern languages was banned. And most shockingly of all, the study of history was banned. Because, as you well know, these subjects encourage critical thought. And Tolstoy did not want there to be any critical thought, uh, particularly towards the regime and the Tsar. You're OK to learn maths and Latin and Greek and divinity because they wouldn't encourage you to question what was going on. There's much increased censorship at the universities and control over student activities. A lot of Russian students are now looking to try and go and study abroad because it's so oppressive in the in the Russian university and so limited in what you can read and what you can study. Um, there was a building of new teacher training uh, colleges, but they were set up not with new ideas, but to just maintain the traditional kind of set of subjects and maintain Tsarist control. And Tolso kept a close eye on who the universities were appointing. Anybody he believed that would be too liberal, too progressive, might let in some Western ideas, he vetoed their appointment. So we're getting a stifling here. Now this is going to have quite a big impact on Russia in, in terms of its development because all the new ideas all, and, and all questioning and all the rest of that is being stopped. So this is not going to, no, this is not going to help Russia's development, though it might prevent 
or its aim is to prevent some of the opposition thoughts growing. In, in law and order, we see incredibly um, oppressive stuff coming out of the regime. Shevardov increased the persecution of ethnic groups and religious minorities. Um, Palin made, made an example of those who were accused of political agitation. Um, in 1879, general governors uh, were given the, the power to try political offenders in military courts. Uh, they, even the third section were either uh, tra tracking down radicals who had fleed abroad, hunting them down and dragging them back to trial in Russia. One area that, where Palin failed is he tried to use um, show trials to deter others. This really backfires kind of three major examples of this, one of which we've looked at in a previous video. So you have the trial of 50 in 1877. Um, the, you've got the trial of 193 in 1878, where there's 153 of the 193 who are acquitted. And those who are convicted are convicted with re really generous um, sentences. And there's, there's the case of Vera Zaslic in 678 um, who quite clearly is guilty and shoots someone um, but is let off because the jury is sympathetic towards her and her cause. And so from that point onwards we get this transfer to uh, to political crimes, to secret courts and these governor generals and it is really quite oppressive the regimes as it's going on at this point uh, towards the end of Alexander II's uh, reign. Now <laughs> Whilst this is going on, Alexander II seems to think again. Uh, and we've got what's known as the Loris um, Malikov Constitution. It's not really a constitution, um, but it was a set of ideas and a set of reforms. Um, there'd been the, the Russia-Turkish War, which Russia had won in 77-78, in but again, against quite a minor power, it had been long and difficult and really showed that Russia still was quite backwards. Um, there was a famine in 1879-1880, which we can maybe equate to what's going on in terms of the attempts on the Tsar's life. There's obviously quite a lot of opposition brewing at this point. And Alexander II seems to, to accept the idea that maybe some further reforms or return to reform is needed. Um, so he sets up a commission under Count Loris um, Malikov, um, and he, was, he actually then signed some of these recommendations on the 13th of March 1881. And so through this commission and, and these ideas, the political prisoners were going to be released. There was going to be relaxation of censorship. Um, there's going to be a lifting of restrictions on the Zemstvo, and there's actually a move to set up a, a national assembly that the Zemstvo have been asking for, with representatives from the nobles, from the Zemstvo, uh, and from the Dumas in the towns. So this idea was that the, the Russian people were going to have representatives who were going to discuss policy and the, the decrees that were going to be set across the country. There was going to be removal of the salt tax. Uh, the third section uh, was abolished and replaced by a section of the police known as the Akrana, which is not an ultimately a great reform because they're going to turn out to be um, just as oppressive and bad as the third section. The key bit on that in terms of the National Assembly is actually signed by Alexander the, the Second on the 13th of March of 1881. But later that day, he gets killed. So Alexander II was travelling to the Winter Palace. Uh, members of the People's World, the revolutionary group, lay in wait. A couple of them threw bombs at the carriage, but they missed, and they, but they exploded, injuring some of the, the, uh, the Tsar's Cossacks. So the Tsar, the Tsar, and I'd never quite understood this, maybe he just shows he was genuinely a nice guy after all, got out of his carriage to go and check on his injured men. Making himself a really easy target for the members of the people's world who were still nearby with bombs in their hands. And they, another bomb is thrown in and it explodes and it kills him instantly. And that is the end of Alexander II. So, <clears throat> the, the, I, I find this really quite a difficult bit. If, if this hadn't happened, then Alexander II may well have continued on the line of reform and we would have got the assembly and we would have got Russia moving uh, in, in a more a more liberal way, more enlightened way, less oppression of its people, uh, uh, a bit more democracy, and things could well have started to improve again. We've seen Alexander II was capable of reform. He'd done it early in his reign. He then pulled back from it. We had his reactionary period uh, following those events, 1865 through 1867. <laughs> things are getting really difficult. There's been attempts on his life. There's a war that's not gone particularly well. There's a famine, and he seems to be going, well, actually, maybe I really do need to bring in some more reform. But at that point, 
an opposition group kills them. Now, part of that might be the opposition groups don't want things to be reformed. They don't want things to get better because things get better, then the then support for revolutionary groups is going to decline. On the other hand, you think this is a terrible, terrible move from a, a, um, a group that wants reform to essentially stop reform. And what they're going to get instead of Alexander II is Alexander III. And Alexander III, having just watched his father being killed by a revolutionary group, is in not going to be in any kind of mood for reform. And that's what we're going to look at in my, our next video on Russia. So thank you very much uh, for watching. Please remember to, to like, to share, to subscribe. Uh, leave me some comments below. Uh, I will be continuing over the coming weeks and months developing this series on Tsarist and Communist Russia. So we're going to go through Ale more stuff on Alexander II. Uh, we're going to go through Alexander III, through onto, um, onto Nicholas and onto the revolutions, and then all the way through into Communist Russia, going all the way uh, through the, the reign of uh, Stalin and through to Khrushchev and finishing in 1964. So that's all to come. It'll take quite a while for me to get all that content up here, but it will be coming eventually. Right. Thank you very much for watching.